How is everyone today? How do you like your new venue? It's quite nice, eh? It's your law of attraction too, yeah? That's right. And so we'd like to thank very much, thank uh, the Batellas for offering this venue to us because it's just a, such a lovely venue. Peter, would, can just, so people know Peter, can Peter stand up? And And Anna is in the kitchen, I think, somewhere. Um, so thanks to Anna too for all the help she's given us for setting everything up as well. Uh, roving mics, who would like to handle them today? There's two of them. They both seem to work, eh? <laughs> and with that one, if you just... Um, that's, don't turn it off. The middle position is mute, and that's the on position. So if okay. you just push it on and, and mute. Yep. Jen, you'd like to handle that? Awesome. And the middle position is mute, yep. and the top position on, don't turn it off. Okay. You should be right. Yep. Well, there's a lot of housekeeping things to talk about with you firstly today. So we'll do that, and then we'll get ourselves going. Have you guys synchronised your cameras and the sound and everything? Yep. All done? Good. All right, um, first thing we'd like to do is just talk a little bit, bit about the venue and, uh, and the treatment of the venue, if we can call it that. And obviously, um, the Batellas are wanting to sell this venue at some point in the future. And so we want to keep it in as pristine shape as possible. So that uh, means that we talked with the helpers today, the, this morning, as a group. Uh, different people have got different jobs to do. And so what we'd like to do is uh, have those people look after those jobs. And if you want to assist those people, and those people know themselves and, and I'm sure you'll get to know them over there. I won't talk about it all now, I can bore you all. But uh, at least we all know, uh, we'll all know eventually who's who in, in terms of who's helping and doing what jobs. And so what we'd like to do is, uh, is have those people responsible for those jobs because they know how the Batellas would like those jobs done because myself and Mary have talked to them about that this morning. We're also probably next time going to change the layer, layout a little, so um, instead of people coming in through this door here, what we might do in the future is coming through the side doors. But the key is always to have your shoes off in the auditorium. Uh, we want to keep the carpet as nice and clean as possible. All the soil here is that red soil, and so if the soil gets inside, we're going to have some nice beige carpet in a different colour. So <laughs> that's not much good, so we want to sort that out. And um, so the shoes, you'll notice there's an area on the side there where you can put your shoes. If, you, if everyone who comes in just puts their shoes on the side there, that'd be good. Uh, obviously, you've seen the kitchen area, many of you would have already seen the dining area there, obviously for food, and obviously outside can be with food. With regard to your children, if you don't know where your children are right now, then you need to do something about that, okay? Because it's really important that you keep uh, a, an eye on them Remember, your children are your law of attraction. So if something goes on with your children, you need to look carefully at your own emotions about what's going on. But also, um, the property has some pretty dangerous areas on it um, where children could fall quite a distance. Um, there's a place over on this side where there's even a fall of probably 20 or 30 feet, 10 metres even. And on this side, that could also occur. So if you don't know where your children are, you need to address that as soon as you can, if, if you can. Um, what other issues have we got, Nolan? Uh, oh yes, smoking. Um, right over, you'll notice sort of that direction. <laughs> There's this blue painted sign on the ground saying smoking area. That's the only place on the property where you can smoke. So if you haven't given up smoking yet, which is a good thing to do for your own self-love, but that's a different <laughs> subject. We won't cover that today. And um, please go and smoke over in that location. That's the only area on the property. Um, might as well give you the mic because it, it's reminding me. <laughs> Just takes a little time there. Just with eating and drinking, if that, um, we can restrict that to outside of this main area. Yeah, no eating and drinking in the auditorium at all. Just water bottles are okay. Water bottles are okay. So, but uh, no bringing of food in here either. Yep. So uh, if we can honour all of these things, and you'll learn them as we go, obviously. If we can honour all of these things, 
Our, uh, our attraction to the venue may be longer than we originally thought. And if we don't honour those things, then obviously our attraction to the venue will be this weekend only. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, that'll be it. So the key is for us to uh, just honour the gift that's been given to us and treat it um, in, in the appropriate manner, in a loving manner. So that, that's, uh, that's some, those are some things I wanted to talk about first. Now, the other thing that I, there's three other things I wanted to mention housekeeping as well, as, as well is that many of you have been interested in the Paget messages and, and on the net you can find the Paget messages for all sorts of prices and costs and all of them uh, presented in different ways. But there's a man, in, uh, there's a man who's edited the Paget messages into, uh, into a chronological order and then made a book which is a pretty solid book. Now, if you order that book on the, on the internet from Lulu, it would cost you around $130. And he spent, Joseph, his man, name is, has spent, he lives in the USA, he spent, he spent quite a lot of his life in the last few years editing these and producing these books. Now, what he's decided to do, with, uh, along with Peter, is actually we can publish these books now in Australia rather than having to buy them on Lulu. And, and the cost of that can be brought down from $130 plus the postage or whatever that you might have to pay down to around $40 or so. All right? So it's a fairly significant saving. And if you're willing to do that by donation, um, Peter would want to just let you know about the different, uh, that, that that's actually available. And, and he was initially thinking of getting maybe a hundred of them printed up. If already ordered. Already ordered a hundred. Um, so there's already a hundred available. And if you can do that by donation, so, so those of you who can't afford the $40, obviously you want to talk to Peter and his staff about that. But if you can afford to, to pay what it costs to reduce, that would be great too if you're going to get one. But these books are available to you now. So rather than getting them over the internet, um, at quite a price and many of you find the price pretty high. There's that book which is a comprehensive book of the Paget messages called the Book of Truths and then there's a little summary book of the divine love teachings if you like with a few spirit messages of the teachings themselves. So that's those and uh, they are all available as well. I think they're going to be on your order form Peter at some point are they? Two, two, or three, two to three weeks for two. the main book. Yep. The, the, having proof for me next week and then Yep, no worries. So there's a little process to go through first and then they'll be available. Yep. Um, you'll also, in the past what I've done is I've uh, talked, to you, to, talked to you about um, when people are doing things by donation and I know that they have a keen th uh, part of you know, practicing the Divine Love Path themselves and I'm happy to actually make some announcements about it. So the next announcement is one of those. Um, Many of you know Carol. Can Carol, you just stand up for a moment so you can see the colourful Carol. <laughs> There's Carol. Carol owns a property um, called Heaven in the Hills up at Mullaney. It has uh, basically six cottages, I suppose you'd call them, though some of them are very uniquely uh, planned and done. And in the month of February this year coming, so in February, she wants to open up to you the ability to come up there and do emotional processing work. And she wondered how many people would actually be interested in that. Now, before you express the interest, um, there's a few little guidelines, of course. Obviously, Carol has quite a number of costs associated with the property and that, that need to be covered. And so what I've recommended to Carol to do is just to give you the costs that are associated as a, as a price. And then what you do beyond that is up to you and, and your feelings of, uh, regarding gratefulness and gratitude and other, other emotions that you would have in terms of uh, giving Carol any other funds that she might need to run the property. But the suggestions at this point by Carol are that um, you might become prepared to do a bit of gardening as well on the property. So, so there's sort of like different things that can be done. What she's doing is she's setting up an area where you can do some anger work, so a bit of, uh, bit of anger work with a punching bag and a few other things like that setting up some different areas and for the month of February she wants to open it to people who are willing, who are wanting to process their emotions rather than, the problem with her doing it any other time obviously is she's got some people who don't want to do it with any emotions coming who don't know about the Divine Love Path and then she's got other people coming who do 
And of course, if you've got one screaming in the back yard, then <laughs> the people who are not doing that get a bit worried, right? So um, what she wants to do is open it up for that month period and just have an idea at this point how many might be interested in that process over the course of that month. Remembering there is six um, different places to stay there and some of those places have quite a number of beds so you could, have, you know, have even a family and things like that could stay as well. But to come with that motive of just dealing with your emotional stuff. Now many of you are living in the city or, and find it hard to go somewhere to scream or yell or, or get involved in some anger or fear and so it would be an ideal opportunity for you. Um, so perhaps if we could, uh, I, I'll leave, give you an hour or a couple of hours to gel on that one and maybe at the start of the next half of the session we'll ask who might, be, who might want to be interested in that so Carol's got a good bit of an idea. Um, so I feel it's quite a good, good idea myself. And who knows, in the end, you might, we might have a continuous stream of those things happening. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Now, um, how many of you never been to one of these uh, seminars before? Can I just have an idea? Yeah, just a few of you, all right. Normally I talk about divine love, divine truth, um, things like God, the universe, and all the secrets of the universe, laws, and all these different things. So um, that's what you would normally get. Today is going to be a little bit different, all right? So I just wanted to warn all those people who are new, don't you go judging today by, <laughs> by what normally would happen. Because today I want to talk about fear. And I want to, I've talked about fear before, um, quite a number of occasions actually, but today I want to focus on some really practical things about fear in order to help you get into your fear. Now, most people on the New Age path or these other paths of progressions, they're all trying to get you out of, their fear, out of your fear, right? And I'm saying to you, actually, that doesn't deal with your fear. All it does is connect you intellectually into suppressing your fears, and then you finish up carrying your fears around you wherever you go, unfortunately. But what we want to do instead of that, and particularly if you want to receive and continue receiving divine love, you're going to need to work through your fears. Now many of you have fears about different things, right? Some of you have fears about coming world changes. Some of you have fears along those lines and so some of you who have fears about it are so involved in finding all about it and finding all the interesting things about it and thinking about it all the time, right? And then others of you who have those same fears do exactly the opposite, you know, the bury the head in the sand, no, no, it's not happening, it's not happening where I am at least, and we do the opposite to that. And, but either way, it's fear still that's governing our interaction with that. And fear generates all sorts of problems, which I want to talk about today. Some of us may have fear of spirit interactions. So we often take two sides of that story as well. We get involved in finding everything about spirits. We surround ourselves every day with the white light and the way we go on that path and we just protect ourselves. Or we go down exactly the opposite path, which is, oh no, there's no such thing as spirits. I don't believe in spirits. And we do the opposite thing and to try and stay away from those fears. Some of us have fears about uh, personal harm, like violence towards oneself that we're yet to process. And so we avoid all the situations that look like anything like that there might be a potential of violence towards ourselves. And at the extreme, we actually finish up avoiding pretty much every place because every place there's people who is potentially uh, going to be violent towards oneself, maybe. And so we avoid those places and eventually we become so fixated on the actual feelings that we're avoiding that we finish up within ourselves um, coming to the point where we believe that we don't have fear at all but in reality our whole life is being governed by fear. So that's part of the problem. Then many of us have problems like multi-generational fears that have been passed down from generation to generation. So let's say your mother had been raped right? and then sometime after the rape gave birth to you. So in other words there was this multi-generational emotion in her that she may not have dealt with that she then passed down to yourself. Then you'll have fears about rape or abuse inside of yourself that you won't necessarily understand and where they came from even, but they'll be there. And uh, we need to be able to release them. We need to be able to let go of them somehow. How do you let go of that? 
Like, that's such a difficult thing to even consider letting go of. Or some of you have come from parents who were in the Second World War. All right? And some of you may have even been very closely associated in the childhood to that. And so what happens there? There was lots of violence and lots of terrible things occurring, terrible atrocities occurring, and those emotions got reflected and imposed upon your soul. And what do you do with those? How, how do you let go of those? Because in the end, if we want to come to God and actually connect to God in this one-on-one -on -one relationship that we've been talking about, what we're going to have to do is get to the point where all of our fears are gone. Every single fear you have will be gone. So you know how you're afraid of snakes and afraid of spies and afraid of violence and afraid of angry people and afraid... All those fears, they'll all be gone. Afraid of rape, afraid of war, afraid of murder, afraid... All those fears, they'll all be gone. Right? When you're at one with God. Won't that be beautiful? It's like, we won't even know ourselves in that state, right? Because <laughs> most of us are still living by our fears. So um, that's the subject that I'd like to discuss with you today. And tomorrow what I'm going to do is spend a lot of time trying purposefully to trigger your fears. All right, so if you're brave enough to come along tomorrow as well, um, there are going to be different things that I present to you and hopefully some of it might be visual as well that I present to you about different fears that you have. And it will be for the purpose of directly starting to confront some of these fears emotionally. So the reason why I wanted to do it in that way is because today I wanted to present to you some practical things you can do to work your way through your fear. And then tomorrow I want to scare the living daylights out of you <laughs> and see what happens and see whether you put into practice the things that we learned today or not. No, 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 I clear out Monday. You're all on your own after that. But remember you... That's one of the fears that we'll address, actually, whether you are on your own or not, because that's part of, part of it. Now, um, during the sessions today, feel free to ask questions, but you'll need to put up your hands. We've got two arriving mics to ask those questions so that we can record them. And before I begin as well, though, on the subject, is I'd like to talk a little about my own uh, emotions this week, because uh, I'm in a fairly disconnected state today, if, if you haven't already noticed. Um, during the week, what's been coming up with me is lots of uh, uh, what you call soulmate grief, I suppose, and lots of grief coming up in me about that subject. And during the week, uh, I realised I had two spirits attached to me as well who are in a deep grief, male spirits who are in deep grief about their soulmates as well, which are heightening my soulmate grief emotions. And so um, I'm having to work my way through those emotions. So if I just burst out crying for no, some unknown reason during the presentation today, you'll know that it's a known reason <laughs> related to that generally. Um, I'm finding with that emotion, I'm really happy about it because it's affecting so many parts of my body and has done for such a long time that I'm really happy to be starting to get into it. But it's just come up at this time when we've got this presentation. That's the way things go at times, isn't it, in your life. And so I'm trying to stay in the emotion that I'm feeling while still... <laughs> presenting this subject to you. So hopefully we'll see how we go with that. Now, um, the presentation that I do today and tomorrow, there'll be a, the topics for them I'm typing up at the moment and they'll be on the internet and they're available on the www.divinetruth.com website under seminar downloads. You'll see the PDF document as well as the MP3 from today. Um, the, the PDF documents um, I hope to have completed by Monday because the PDF document tomorrow is going to give you a list of movies and books that you can watch and read purposefully to trigger certain types of fears. Right? And initially we thought we'd only come up with 10 or 20, but at the moment the list way up there at, and I'm still going, so I don't know when we're going to get it finished between uh, today and Monday. But... What there is is a long list of different types of movies. Now, what I would like you to do, and this is just a suggestion, is for the next month, spend time confronting your fears and use the techniques that you learn today, the practical things that you learn today, to actually address those fears, to actually get into those fears and experience them emotionally. Now, whenever we talk about fear or terror, the majority of us instantly going to, why would I want to do that for? You know, what's AJ suggesting? 
yeah, I am a bit crazy sometimes, isn't it? That's what it seems like. And, uh, and particularly making a crazy suggestion like we are going to go into our fears rather than avoid them. You know, most people spend most of their life avoiding. So. But there are some really powerful reasons why you need to look at addressing your fears. Firstly, all of your fears are what cause your physical pain. So every tiny little bit of physical pain you ever experience in your body or headaches or any of those, all of them are because of fears. Fears are the blocking or capping emotion. So that's what I'd like to talk about with you for a moment. I've uh, just remembered my pens. Um, sorry about the whiteboard as well today. We ordered another one, but these are not very good pens. Um, we ordered another one, but it hasn't arrived yet. So the next time we come, there should be this great big thing that the majority of you can see a bit be better with. Just all of them, babe. I'll, I'll grab them. Thanks. Next that one. Got my collection in here. A bag of goodies. All right, well, let's look what's happening with fear. What happens is underneath everything, we have some causal emotion. Causal emotion is like grief, shame, sadness, those kind of emotions. Causal emotion, they were created in us when we were very, very young children, usually, right the way up through our childhood and sometimes into our teenage years. And it's all those emotions that actually generate our law of attraction. Now, even the ones that haven't been here before, have you heard of the term law of attraction? Most people have, yeah? The law of attraction is based around what's going on at you in your causal emotion. So in other words, when I feel something inside of my soul, which is all causal emotion, something related to my childhood, those particular emotions, whether I am aware of it or not, and perhaps if we can maybe just open up one of those side doors so that people can come in on the side. Yeah. Um, whether I feel those causal emotions or not, they generate my law of attraction. So my whole life is governed by these causal emotions, whether I am aware those emotions exist inside of me or not. Right? And this is what a lot of people call the subconscious. You know? And it's that causal emotion that generates everything. Now on top of that, we usually have blocking emotions. These are the emotions that we were taught to use, usually via our parents, but also by our environment. We were taught to use these blocking emotions to avoid the experience of the causal emotions. Now, the biggest blocking emotions are fear-related. Your fear. I'm terrified of dealing with this emotion and so straight away I'm now blocking the experience of that emotion. Now the fear creates all of my problems when it comes to my body. So that my body will start to close down in different areas related to the different emotions, the causal emotions that I'm not experiencing. So you see this happening as we grow older and older, different parts of our body start shutting down. So, you know, you might have been fit young when you were young, but when you're getting to 40 or 50, you start feeling, and, and, and the doctors start diagnosing, oh, they might have heart attack issues, for example. So heart problems. And a lot of these problems are so-called generational because they are passed down from parents to children through their emotional set. So here I am feeling these emotions, and, uh, or usually not feeling them, but passing them down to, from parent to child. And so I'm growing up now and I get into my later years and my body starts packing up. And my body's packing up because I am suppressing the actual causal emotions that, that if released, would then my body would operate perfectly. 
I would have no pain, sleep fine every night, have no, no tablets to take, no medication to take, all of those different things. None of that would happen. But because I've got these blocking emotions, and in particular the fear, what happens is that these causal emotions never get addressed. They never get released. And so it's like carrying around lead weights with you for the rest of your life. Now, you can do that while you're fit and healthy and you know, as you're growing up, but the, the longer a lead weight is carried, the harder it is to carry, right? And that applies to your body too. So there's this whole series of blocking emotions, of which fear is probably the most dominant, that cause you to suppress your causal emotion. But often what happens on top of that is we have another layer. And this other layer is the layer that is our little indicator layer, I, I'd like to call it sometimes. These are the denials, which are also emotions. So they're denial emotions. Now, the one I would like to talk about particularly today is anger. Now, remember in previous discussions I've always said anger includes annoyance, slight annoyance, frustration, and all those kind of things too. So we're not just talking about I'm in a rage, I'm talking about everything from rage right the way down to slight annoyance. That all I'm going to bundle together as all as anger. Now, they are denial emotions. The anger, so if we look at anger in particular, is the method we use to suppress our fear or to deny our fear even exists. Now, one of the things I've noticed is that many of the people who have been hearing about the Divine Love Path for the last 12, 18 months or so, many of you have started to deal with some emotions but then get stuck in this anger. Right? And we're getting stuck in anger because we want to avoid our blocking emotions, which is our fear primarily about something. And our fear is of helping us get away from our causal emotions. Now, if you look at this from the point of view of changing your law of attraction, so even if you don't want to involve God in the process and all you want to do is just be happier, your happiness is directly dependent upon your causal emotion. In other words, What's happening to you day-to-day -day life is that your soul is attracting all of the events around you. Every single moment your soul is continually sending out all these different signals, right? And all of these things that come to you, all of the events that happen to you are all because of your causal emotion. They're not necessarily because of your blocking emotions and they're not necessarily because of your denial emotions. They all start at your causal emotional area. Now, blocking emotions can also create, but if you get rid of the causal emotion, you'll never have a blocking emotion to create. So, so if we focus on this particular part here, we can rapidly change our law of attraction so that we can be happy quite quickly. But the problem is that for the majority of us is we've got this anger first and then this fear and then there's the emotion. And many of you have heard that the emotions that are the healing emotions are really grief-based emotions. Right? And then on top of the grief, we've got the fear of the grief. And then on top of that, we've got the anger about the fear of the grief. And so what we're doing a lot of times is we're working in this level where we're angry all the time or we're annoyed or even slightly annoyed or we even go one step further to all of this. And this is the place that a lot of New Age uh, type philosophies recommend you go to. You go into denial of the denial emotion. Right? The denial emotion is anger and you go into denial of your own anger. So you talk to a person, you're very angry. No, I'm not. Right? And you've got all this rage coming out of them. You, know, you can feel it coming out of them a lot of times, right? Just being with them is uncomfortable and yet they'll say, no, I'm not angry. And why do they do that? Because they're now using the intellect to actually suppress all emotion. Right? Now when we get into that state where we start suppressing like anger and, and which is suppressing fear and so forth, that's when we're starting to get into the depressive states as well, where we start suppressing all emotion and all depression actually is a result of our desire to suppress anger-based emotions. Does that make sense? 
So you've got this layer upon layer thing happening. Most people, you know, you've heard about other people talk about it with, the, with regard to onion layers, if you like, and things like that. How you think about it is up to you. What I'm trying to do today and this weekend is to address this area here, this area of blocking emotions and the area of the emotions of denial. Because what I've found myself is that if I address those areas, once I get rid of them, all of the causal emotions just pop out of me like no effort at all. If I don't address them, those causal emotions frustrate the hell out of me. Right? You notice that with your own emotional processing. You're trying to access an emotion, you're trying to access an emotion. And my suggestion is if you're trying to access an emotion, give up on trying. <coughs> Don't bother trying anymore because you've got a block. And rather than, you know, many of us know, oh, I'm sad about my mother dying, for example. Or I'm sad about my child dying when he, she was, he was two. Or I'm sad about, you know, what happened when I was in, a, in childhood abuse. I'm sad about, you know, these different events. Many of us know what we're sad about, but we can't feel the sadness. And the reason why we can't feel the sadness is because of these layers that we've got on top that need to firstly be removed. And it's those layers that prevent the emotional experience. Right? So, let's look at this process. I'm saying that we're at the stage now where we're no longer deciding to use our intellect anymore. Have, have you made that choice yet? <laughs> right? No longer give up the intellect, just no longer decide to use the intellect. That's the place where you're no longer going to meditate yourself out of an emotion. Do you know what I mean by that? Like calm yourself down, you know, lay, or even go along to some kind of therapist who gets you out of the emotion by doing whatever they do. And you come away feeling really good, but three days later you're not feeling good again and you feel like you've got to go back. So you go back and lay on the table and have the same thing done again. You go out feeling good and then two days later you're not feeling good again. So you go back and, and we become addicted even to the process of feeling good in that, in that state. In the end we need to address the cause. If we address the cause, we'll address the cause and we'll feel good all the time on that issue. We won't have to go back anywhere. Our body will, won't have to have the same pains in it anymore. All of those things change. So what I'm finding with my body is that if I don't deal with an issue, my body lets me know now really rapidly. Really, have, and many of you are finding that too? Really rapidly I'm getting it's shown to me what's going on. And the key is to listen to your body. Your body's a very good barometer of what you're denying. Right? So I go along and do some spiritual work or some emotional work and I, and I used to have headaches and then I go along and do the work and for a week or two I still have headaches and then I, I, I don't have headaches and then I start getting headaches again. Is the cause dealt with? No. no. Quite simple. Right? You find you have these like, little pains in your knees, you know, like I don't know about you but sometimes I have them, you know, where you've got a pain in the knee and all of a sudden you're working away and all of a sudden your knee sort of goes clunk or whatever it is and, then, and from then on it starts to hurt. And this happens on a regular basis. It doesn't happen anymore for me, but it used to happen on a very regular basis. I haven't dealt with the emotion, whatever that's about. Right? There's an emotion related to that. Right? Everything is based around a soul-based denial of an emotion or the acceptance of one. In my case at the moment, I've got terrible bowel pro pro pains. Right? So that anybody who comes out to my house knows that flatulation is the way, way of the game, right? <laughs> and uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, because, there's, because I've got these emotions connected to this uh, unworthy feeling that I have about myself in relation to my soulmate, right? So, so that's there pretty constantly. Have I dealt with it? No. Because it's still happening, right? Every uh, now and then what happens is, I, I don't know if you've noticed today, but my thumb is cracking again. Um, every time, and then it happens again. So, so I, I think I've dealt with emotion and then a month later my thumb cracks again. Like, so I haven't dealt with the emotion. I know what it's about, but I still haven't got to the end of it, the cause of it. And my body's telling me constantly. Right? And that's, your body's doing the same. It's just whether we notice it or not. That's the thing. So forget the intellect. The intellect's not very good. The only good thing about the intellect is it's a good way of helping you get back into the emotion. So your intellect can help you get out of your emotion or you, you can use your intellect to help you get back into your emotion. 
it's up to you which way you use it, it's just a tool. So let's look at the denial emotions. Anger. There's only usually two reasons for anger. One is we have an expectation that's not getting met. All right. That's number one. I have an expectation in me that my environment, you guys are not meeting. You're not treating me nice, I'm angry with you. Does that make sense? It's my anger, there's something inside of me. It comes from a deeper emotion within myself. No matter how you treat me, if I'm angry, there's something within myself that I need to address emotionally. Right? That's the key thing to remember there. Anger is really good emotion and we've, talk, we've talked about anger a lot in the past because anger tells you, it's your guide towards your fear. Anger tells you when you're afraid. So if you can remember that. When I am angry, I am just afraid and denying it. <laughs> so if you can remember that. When I am angry, and replace with angry if you want, slightly annoyed, frustrated, <laughs> and all of those things that are all related to anger. When I am angry, I am just afraid, but denying it. So anger is an excellent tool to tell you when you're really scared about something. And I don't mean physically scared, I mean emotionally scared about something. Dennis, if we could have a mic, if you leave your hand up, because that way. Hey Jay, is it possible to to have fear to get into anger? Um, certainly. If anger, anger can also be, remember, a causal or a blocking childhood emotion. So remember that uh, sometimes in your childhood you had deep grief associated with constant bad treatment, right? And then that then clicked into a blocking emotion, and the blocking emotion that grief is often anger at the childhood level. And then you could have adult fear about dealing with your anger, certainly. So that certainly does apply. But you won't have... Um, adult anger about dealing with your adult fear. Uh, so, sorry, the other way around. Adult fear about dealing with your adult anger. It'll be coming from some kind of childhood. Yeah, it course. feels... I can feel it there, but it's I'm quite frightening. Yes. Well, you think about what happened to most people when they were little, when they got angry. What did mum and dad do then? Shut you down. Well, usually you got a belt, right? Corporal punishment usually was the aim of the game, generally, in that state. So what do you associate with getting angry? Pain. So obviously that association needs to be broken in order for you to work your way through that emotion. So that certainly can be the case. But remember, even if that is the case, the anger, even the childhood anger, is still the denial of the childhood grief. Does that make sense? So it still applies, what I'm saying still applies really in the end. There's these layers, and if you've got the adult layer suppressing the childhood layer, that's just an additional layer on this path, if you like. The key is to allow yourself to experience. And when you do, you'll get through them all. But it certainly can be the other way around. Uh, at the childhood level, but not at the adult level. Yeah. So does everyone understand what I mean by that? Yeah? So I feel a bit of uncertainty about that from some of you. No? Okay, you don't have to answer questions if you don't want to. <laughs> all right, so my anger, which is my denial emotion. My anger is a great tool, you know. It's a great tool fastest way to shut down another person, get angry with them. So we learn that at a very young age. Get angry, get angry, and we use anger in two ways. One way is, is because we've had some grief or pain that is over and over and over occurring, reoccurring over and over again. Now when we have reoccurring grief or pain, we eventually get angry. So most ch children have had that when you think about it, reoccurring grief or pain. How many of you felt unloved very young age and then felt unloved most of your childhood? Over and over and over again, right? Majority of us, really. So what's happening there is the feeling of being unloved, feeling I'm unloved again, I'm unloved again. Eventually you get so hurt inside of yourself that you just get angry about it. right? Because we're not releasing the grief and, and the grief is just happening over again and over again. And so eventually we get angry. So that's a childhood anger-based emotion, which we often then try to express, and then we got shut down through pain. So we got punished or whatever for expressing it, and we got shut down through pain. 
So now we've got the blocking emotions of our childhood anger and pain associated with our childhood anger. So that's one of their blocking emotions. Now, it, if you think about it, what was shutting us down really, at, even at the childhood level, was fear of pain. Does that make sense? It's not actually fear of anger, because we were fine getting angry before we got the pain, right? It's actually a fear of pain associated with anger. That's the reason why we shut down a lot of times. Anyway, so we shut down at childhood level. We're so afraid now of the pain that now as an adult, we're protecting our pain all the time. Right? And so every time our pain gets triggered, bang, I'm into protection of my pain zone, you know? And as soon as I'm that, I'm in protection of the castle, as it's often called, right? So we've got this castle of emotions and we're just trying, trying, trying to protect them all the time. So there's our anger. Remember I said there's two reasons for anger? And just to cap them again, one is that we have an expectation that is not being fulfilled from our, from our environment that is not being fulfilled. Now, underneath that expectation from our environment is really a feeling that you should fix something that I have inside of me. Did you see that? So if I get angry with you, I'm saying that you're responsible for what I'm feeling. That's really what I'm saying. And you're not responsible for what I'm feeling, but I want to make you responsible for what I'm feeling. Why would I want to do that? Because I don't want to feel it myself. Right? And instead I want to make you responsible for causing me to feel it and you responsible for fixing it. Right? So that's one reason for anger. The other obviously reason for anger, and in, the, in fact the majority of times, the second one is the truth, and that is we're just afraid. We're just really afraid. But we don't want to admit to ourselves we're afraid. What happens when you admit to yourself when you're afraid when you're a little kid at school? Failure. Everybody starts picking on you and you know what I mean? You're a weakling and you're gutless and you know, everyone starts laughing at you and every and so what do you do? You put on this other facade. The other facade is I'm the brave Johnny, you know? And the brave Johnny, he does everything that AJ wouldn't normally do. Right? So and he, he's the one who looks after me in the, in the end, really. But it's really, in the end, an avoidance of the underlying fear of total vulnerability. So let's just uh, remove the denial emotions for a moment. So we just replace it with what we often have, which is anger. We remove the blocking emotions and replace it with what we often have, which is fear. So now we're getting down to some causal emotion that is... And the causal emotion, let's replace it with this emotion, grief. That's what's normally locked up in us. That process, if you like, is what's going on. So if I'm finding I'm slightly annoyed, frustrated, slightly angry, angry, intensely angry, in a rage, murderous, <laughs> that is up in that bracket there, all of that. If I find in this one that I'm like slightly agitated, a bit fidgety, right the way through to fearful, right the way through to terrified, that's in that bracket there. Right? And then when in this one I'm slightly sad, just a little morose, a little bit down, right the way through to sobbing with grief, that's in that bracket there if you like. All right, so what we want to do is address why we get into anger. And so what I'm really saying is the reason why we're getting into anger is because we're really in fear and we don't want to acknowledge it. Right? And while we're in fear, fear is the cause of all of my pain. That's what I need to remember. Also, fear is going to prevent you from ever being at one with God. When you become at one with God, you will never, never have fear again. I just want to read something from you, from these, from the pageant messages for, for you, written by a spirit. One of my friends, Andrew. His name is. He said, "I am here, Andrew. I came to tell you that where love is, there can be no sin or unhappiness, and fear is not. We who live in the celestial spheres know this to be a fact." And with all the force and authority that knowledge gives, 
we declare this truth to you tonight. The love that casts out all fear is the divine love of the Father and when a spirit obtains that there exists no such thing as fear and nothing that could create or permit fear to exist. That's a pretty definite statement, isn't it, about what love does. Now, scientists and, and, and psychologists and everyone would argue differently. What they would say to you is that, no, you actually naturally experience fear. Right? So if you walk across the road and all of a sudden a car hits you, right in that particular moment, they say you will experience fear. Right? Just before that, maybe just before that moment occurs. So that's an interactional fear, if you like. And they define it, I forget what the term is, I think I've written it down here in this outline for you to read later. Um, they define it as what they call realistic fear. Fear based on a real situation. Now, the next set of fears that they say are the fears that are the result of the original thing occurring. So, let's say I got run over by a car when I was little. The next set of realistic fears are, all right, whenever I come up to a road, I'm going to be careful, right? Because the last time I came up to a road when I was little, I got run over or whatever. So from then on, I start to be careful. I start to be living in this fear, if you like. And then as an adult, I'm just afraid of crossing the road. So, you know, I never jaywalk, walk. I always go up to the sign and then... You know, here in Queensland where you can just walk across the road and hope everybody stops. But of course, you worry that nobody's going to. So, so you, you know, you step out the road and you wait for them to, yeah, now I'm on, right? And so we have these fears come up. These are, these are what are called, this, the uh, psychologists would call natural fears. But what God's saying to us really is that in the end we won't have any fear at all, even those kind of fears. Why won't we? Because we'll already know what to do in every situation. So how would you be afraid if you knew what to do in every situation? You couldn't be really, could you? If you know, if you know oh, there's a, car that, there's a car in that, there's a guy in that car who's not going to stop for me, you're not going to walk across the road. If you can feel his emotions before you even look at him, you would know whether to walk across the road in front of him or not. Can you see that? You say, oh no, he's not paying attention, I'll just wait here and let him go past and then I'll go across. But then another person, you, you can just, and you'll feel this in time, You'll just feel totally in synchronicity with all of your environment and you'll, you'll be able to just walk up and walk across the road and you know that the person behind you saw you and you know the other person saw you and you, so of course you won't have any fear at all. Does that make sense? When you're in a state where you've dealt with all the fears, you can actually start feeling all the emotions of everyone around you much more easily. And because of that, because of feeling all those emotions, you're now far in, more in tune with your entire environment which means you don't finish up doing things that harm you automatically, not as a choice because of fear, but it's just an automatic process. So when you get that, and when you're at one with God, you're in, that, you're in tune with the entire universe, really. And when you're in tune with the entire universe, you're not afraid of anything. So someone can threaten you with death, and you would not be afraid of it. Whereas if you didn't have those feelings, if you had those other feelings, causal emotions, you would be. So we can get into that state. So really what God's saying to us is, you don't need to be afraid at all. And so we go, oh, okay. I don't need to be afraid at all. Okay. So what do we do then? We start trying to not be afraid at all. <laughs> right? Because that's what we're told. You know, at the end of our development, we're not going to be afraid at all. Okay. All right, I'll start acting like I'm not afraid at all. Now that's a very fictitious place to be because in the end you do have emotions inside of you. The only way to actually experience what I'm talking about in reality is to release the emotion of fear inside of you. Does everyone follow that? Because without releasing the emotion of fear, the emotion of fear still exists within you, no matter how much you intellectually try to avoid it, it's going to be within you, still creating your law of attraction, and everything around you will be happening based on that. So it's far better to experience your fear. But that's where most of us freak out. Most of us have huge problems with that. 
Because the very first time you experience a fear event in, in, as a causal emotion type fear, like there's a blocking emotion, a childhood blocking emotion, you will be quite terrified. You might even be on the ground and shaking and all these things happening to your body and all your body's in a cramp, you know, and, and anybody coming along looks at you and thinks, oh, doctor, hospital, you know, and like that's how people respond to that kind of physical expression of those emotions. So even the, the whole universe around you, it feels, but it's actually really people on earth around you, are actually against you fully expressing your fears. And of course, the only way to go from that, if, you're not, if you can't fully express your fears, the only place to go is anger. You notice how anger seems to be far more acceptable? Like, you know, how many men are in a rage and yet, you know, most of society accepts it, right? And we have all of these outlets for anger in society, you know, like sports and outlet for anger for a lot of men. War is an outlet for anger, isn't it? Like, you see all these outlets for anger. But how many outlets for fear do we have? Like, do you ever see people very much dealing with their fear in an emotional experience? Have you ever done it in front of somebody else, for example? Yourself. Like, every time I've ever done it in front of somebody else, they have absolutely freaked out. <laughs> now, that's not very helpful for me <laughs> getting to my causal emotion, right? And, and, and I remember the first time when I experienced it, I was 18 years of old age. I was vomiting in the toilet and uh, all of a sudden I went through into this fear place, this fear fit things that I used to have. And I had so much fear that like, yeah, I, just, I had these fear fits for, for, for most of my life. But they started having in an intense way when I was 18. And I was trying to open the door of the toilet to yell out to somebody and all of my body just went into complete lock up. Right? There's a medical term for it but I won't bore you with all those things. And I was there, I couldn't speak, all of my face was all lined with my, my muscles all like clamping my jaw shut. All of my muscles in my body caused my legs to go up and I was actually hanging by one arm off the ground in the toilet on the doorknob, which was a round doorknob, right, hanging there, not able to let go of the doorknob and bashing my head was the only thing I could do. So I hit my head on the wall trying to let other people know in the house that I was locked in the toilet and, <laughs> and was in this state, right? Took about 10 minutes or so for somebody to answer. And this was straight after I had a car accident. This was about maybe four or five days after I had a car accident. So the car accident triggered all this fear. I went into this place emotionally and I'm there hanging by this door in this terrible state of terror, hardly being able to breathe, my body all locked up all the muscles all locked up and everything just hanging on the door. Now it took two, two men to open the door and get me off the doorknob. And then once I got off the doorknob, they took me to the bed and, and they called the doctor, of course, right? And they called the doctor and everyone's all worried. My, sister's, my sister was there present and she was screaming. <laughs> and, and everyone else was in a panic. And I, like, this is about my own fear and everyone else is in a panic, right? And, and my doctor, the doctor comes along and gives me a great big shot, you know, and all of a sudden I'm out to it for, for quite a few hours. I think it was about 16 hours or so. Now, and that was my first terror experience. Right? And nobody around me wanted to <laughs> know about it. And uh, I had a number since then. I had, in fact, uh, up until I was around 33, I had about eight of those uh, experiences. And, um, and what it taught me was that people are terrified of your own terror. And it's so much so that when I knew, I could feel these experiences coming on after a while, after the first few times, I could recognise the symptoms of me going into this fear state. And what happened was, I would tell the people, all the people around me, I'm going to go into this fear state now. <laughs> This is what you're going to need to do. This is how you're going to need to treat me. I had to sort of give them a heads up, right, before they'd actually allow me to go through the experience. And eventually I got to the point when I was 33 where I started facing the terror face on, like head on. And so I had two of those fits a day for three months. Right? So eventually I got through them all. They started off, they were about two hours long. 
I, the best way I could liken them was for me, it was like I was in a, I was in, um, what's that when you get cramp, you know, but cramp all through your body for two hours straight. Can't speak, can't do anything else, just, and a lot of times I passed out because I couldn't breathe properly either. I always survived them. And they, you know, the doctors did their thing, you know, you know, the ECGs and the scans and all those different things and found nothing, of course. And, and of course, because it's all emotional, it's all driven by emotions. And eventually I learnt how to deal with fear. And it was an amazing thing to be able to learn how to do with fear. Because after three months, I never had one of those again, ever. One of those fear fits ever again. And after that time, I was not afraid of dealing with any single emotion inside of myself. So that was the benefit of experiencing those things. It was the fear that was preventing me from actually accessing other emotions. And so I had to work through the fear first. And for many of us in the audience, this is the process you're going to have to go through, maybe to not that intensity, but you're going to have to start confronting these fears that are within you and allowing their experience. Now, I'm saying you'll need to allow their experience, not just the thought of it. Okay? Now, that what I want to do today is give you lots of tools through by which you can do this. Lots of tools to actually help you get into these fear-based experiences and have the courage and the ability to get your way through them so they no longer affect your life at all. Does that make sense? That's the idea. Now, who's already frightened? <laughs> okay. Okay. No worries, that's good. By tomorrow afternoon, we'll be really there, hopefully. Um, the key is that with every one of these experiences, you will live through it. And I would like to discuss with you two Two basic errors that we have as a part of our belief system that's al almost in, well, from what I've seen, it's in every single person on the in the human race. And by the way, there are literally thousands of spirits with us here and many of them have exactly the same problem. Right? So it's not just present here on earth but also in the spirit world. The first belief is this. Belief number one. This is a fear-based belief, right, that we have. Belief number one is, I cannot cope with all of my emotions. Right. Now, let's just look at this fear from a practical point of view. If I believe that, can you see how that's going to stop me from having my emotional experiences? If I believe I'm not going to be able to cope with every single emotion that's going to come at me from within myself, because that's the only place they can come from, from within yourself. If I believe that, then I am going to start shutting down emotional experiences that I believe I'm not going to be able to cope with. So, what we finish up doing when we're in this state is we say, all right, the divine love path is, we've got to be allowing our emotions on the divine love path to connect to God. You know, love is emotional, so I've got to learn how to love, so that's an emotion too. So I start seeing the relationship between emotions and love and, and connecting to God. So I understand all of that. And so I then go down the track of, all right, what emotions can I cope with? <laughs> oh, I can cope with, you know, feeling uh, fear about somebody being angry with me. Yeah, I cope with that. So what I do is my soul creates an event where somebody's angry with me and I go into my fear about that, feel that, and I get through that. And then after a while, if I've dealt with that from a causal emotion, gone through some grief, what eventually happens is nobody gets angry with me anymore. And that's wonderful, so I've had some gain there. But then I might have been abused as a child. And that's a whole set of emotions, isn't it? Like if, you're, if any of you have been abused as a child, either sexually or violently, know how difficult it is to work through those groups of emotions, right? Now, those emotions, I might definitely have this feeling that I just cannot cope with them. So I put those emotions to the side, over there, in that box over there, and then I usually put a few books on top of that box and 
happen to them, and just and eventually I make that box disappear into the disappears from my own consciousness. And so then I go down and, and eventually you come up to someone like AJ or someone else who's connected with their emotions too and you say, you know, I reckon I've dealt with most of the things in my life and, and they can feel this thing. And, and oh, if you dealt with your abuse issue when you were a child, oh, I don't remember being abused when I was a child. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's happened? What's happened is that there's so many blockages now to that box of emotion that we can't even, even connect with the fact that that's even happened. Right? But that whole box is going to have to be opened, you know, and allowed out. Now, if I believe this, that I cannot cope with all of my emotions, I am never going to open that box. You see the problem with that belief? If I believe that, that box is going to stay closed. And I'll pass over into the spirit world and I've talked to literally thousands and thousands of spirits who still have the same box closed. You know, a lot of people on earth have this belief that when I pass over into the spirit world, that means all of a sudden I'm all knowing and all of my problems are gone and I don't have any more emotions that are sad anymore to deal with and everything's fine. And that's not what happens because I've talked to literally thousands of spirits where that hasn't happened. What's happened instead is that they've had this belief that they can't cope with their emotions, with all their emotions, that got constructed at a very young age in their life on earth and they still have that same belief in the spirit world. And they live in that state for many hundreds, if not thousands of years. A few weeks ago we talked to a group of spirits who uh, travelled with myself and Mary in the first century. And those, that group of spirits still were locked up in this state. They felt that they couldn't feel some of their emotions about what happened in their interaction with myself after 2,000 years. So don't think that just because you've you know, had some kind of uh, death experience or gone and died and then, then everything is going to be fine because while you have that belief in you, it's not going to be fine. We need to deal with this belief, this number one fear-based belief. Number two fear-based belief. I am alone. Now I'm not saying to change these beliefs by the way, not intellectually anyway. Right? What I'm saying is we need to recognise these as major impediments to our emotional processing. Now an extension of I am alone is God doesn't care for me, God doesn't exist, I haven't got any spirit friends around me, I've got no friends on earth really who care about my emotions either, I am alone. And what I'm saying is that that belief shuts you down in a state of fear from experiencing your emotion. Does that make sense? There are many flavours of these beliefs, like a flavour of this belief um, could be things like um, Is that still working? Yeah, that's still working. These are both on the same system, so it means this thing is going. All right, so my number one, my number one belief, this I cannot cope with all of my emotions, that belief can cause other subsequent beliefs, is what I'm discussing. And other subsequent I I beliefs are my emotions are too big to be able to be felt by one person. The truth is, of course, quite different than that. If the emotion entered you, then you can certainly, it can certainly exit you. Right? But a lot of times we have these emotions enter us, get stored, another one enters us, get stored, another one enters us, get stored, another one enters us, get stored. What happens then? We've now got five of them and now it's starting to look pretty big, right? So this is the result of us not being able to release the emotions one by one. This one is more insidious. This one is basically saying that there is no God and there's no God that cares for you. You are alone. God doesn't love you. That's a big belief, a fear-based belief that majority of the earth has. 
Now, with these two primary fear-based beliefs, we will not experience causal emotion. You'll get to a causal emotion that you need to experience and you won't be able to experience it because one of those two beliefs is present in us. So obviously one of the first things we need to do is emotionally experience those beliefs. Does that make sense? Because remember, fear can only be released by the emotional experience of fear. How do you release that you're alone? By actually feeling you're alone and releasing that emotion, by actually feeling the emotion. It's only the unfelt emotions that get locked up or stored inside of you. When the emotions are in, in motion, when they're actually being felt by you, they're no longer getting locked up inside of you. Now, let's look at those things in terms of what the truth is. Now, what I've done is written in the outline that I've given, that, that I'll be putting on the net, some of the truths about this. And I wanted to read them because they, there's some quotes from different people that I want to get right. One is from a lady who wrote a heap of childhood books. She, her name's Trace Moroni. Have you, any of you heard of her? Trace Moroni. She wrote this book and a group of books, actually. One of these books is called When I Am Feeling Scared. My, my suggestion is buy her whole set of books. Excellent books, all of them. Anyway, this is a quote from one of these books. When children trust themselves to handle painful feelings of fear, anger and sadness, they gain an inner security that allows them to embrace the world in which they live. With greater tolerance of painful feelings, children become free to enjoy their world, to feel secure in their abilities and to be happy. You see, you imagine the gift of a little child knowing that no matter what emotion it has to face in its life, it's going to be able to deal with it. That's a pretty big gift, isn't it? And, and uh, most of our children actually believe that. Believe it or not, before we get involved in their lives, they actually believe that. But what happens is all of this multi-generational stuff gets imposed on them and eventually they no longer believe that. So that addresses this truth, this error, doesn't it? Or this fear is addressed by that truth. If I have the confidence to deal with every single emotion that's within me, no matter what, no matter what it is, then of course... I am going to feel like I'm pretty secure within myself. I won't need you to fix my emotion. I won't need you to make anything feel better. I can be alone and still feel totally secure. Huh? Very important. A quote from the pageant messages. From all this you may understand that we spirits who know the truth have a great work to do to enable these darkened spirits to understand and believe that their false hopes and dreadful fears have no foundation in truth and will never be realized. You see, this is the other problem with fear. If something happens when we're a child, it gets locked up inside of us, and we then carry that around with us the rest of our life, thinking it's going to happen again. Right? But most of the time it never happens again. Right? Most of the time, the things we are afraid of never happen again. And of course, when we get to the spirit world, they can't happen again, you see. And so, unfortunately, a lot of people, by the time they get to the spirit world, have such a strong belief inside of them that these things, that they need to be afraid of these things, that they now, it's now only their belief that stops them from progressing. So, for instance, let's say you were growing up in a religion when you're on earth four or five going along to ch Sunday school and you get told that if you do a bad thing, if you lie, you'll be in hell forever. Now many of you have been told this in your childhoods, right? Now you imagine, if you come to believe that emotionally, what's going to happen? Right. Well, for a start, there's a high likelihood you won't do anything wrong by the definition of the people who gave you that belief. But secondly... You are now so locked up in fear of doing something wrong that you often will get into the mode of never trying anything at all, just in case you might do something wrong. And you'll be so locked up in that belief that you'll even believe that if you have done something wrong that you're condemned forever. Now, these are beliefs that people pass with over in, into the spirit world. 
And what's all that about? It's all about some underlying causal emotional beliefs that we have some terror or fear about in the end. Many of you will notice even with other things that you weren't afraid when you were little. But how many of you played with spiders when you were small? Right? How many of you same people found that mum or dad really went into a panic when you did it? Okay? Right? I remember playing with a red back spider when I was very small, I was about two or so, and I put it on my hand and I walked in to my mum <laughs> to give her the red back spider <laughs> and she went absolutely ballistic. Right? Now many of us will think that's a, that's a realistic fear, but it's not really. I wasn't afraid of it and the red back wasn't biting me, but since that moment, what do you think I've been afraid of? Some spiders, right? And, uh, and so naturally, sooner or later, because of this fear, it's going to get triggered, isn't it? So I've had spiders falling on me. I've gone, and you know, all sorts of things that happened with spiders since that time. Before then, everything was fine and I was fine with them. And ironically, the same thing happened to my youngest son as well. His mother did the same thing with him and he's in the same state with spiders. So why did that happen? It's because I've had this fear injected, if you like, into me and now it's lived with me until I release it. So I'm not afraid of them now because I've had to release that. Does that make sense? I've had to deal with that emotion and release that and experience that emotion. How do you do that? You go and get a movie like Arachnophobia. You ever seen that movie? Where there's spiders walking inside of people's nose and these big things, like big spiders, right? And what you do is you sit down with the movie and you play it over and over again and feel your terror about it and just allow yourself to experience it. Or, like some of the other things I've done, is laid down and just imagine spiders crawling over me and, and just laying there and not being able to do anything. Uh, and just feel the fear that comes up and breathe and breathe, diaphragmatically breathe and just feel the fear, feel the fear, feel the fear. Until you can get to the point where you can pick one up. And then, um, like, and uh, there's still a little more work I feel I've got to do with it because I still have a tendency to still avoid them a little. So I'm not afraid with them anyway. I can pick them up and whatever. But I still have this tendency that there's this initial, you know how you have that initial, oh, what's that? Oh, that's a spider. Like, so there's, there's still a little bit of fear there, right? Still, still there needing to be dealt with. But eventually you can work your way through all of those kind of fears. How many of you are afraid of snakes? Yeah. Yeah, well, Peter here, he's not afraid of snakes. Right? What Peter does is he goes along and picks them up by the tail, even if it's a tiger snake. Right? It's true, it's true, I've seen a picture of him doing it. He's got a, he, you, have, you ask him to have a look at some of his pictures that he's got home, and you'll see him holding up a tiger snake like this. <laughs> right? So he's not afraid of snakes. So why isn't he afraid of snakes? <laughs> Hasn't been injected. By the fear. Yeah, by the fear. Mind you, Peter's been bitten a few times by different creatures, haven't you? Yeah, you want to talk a little? Yeah, just with the mic. I, I have been bitten quite a few times and um, the, the cure's worse than the bite. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when you go to hospital, they just, they're just so excited that someone's been bitten by a snake, they just want to inject you with everything <laughs> they've got. And if you don't explain to them really carefully which snake, which snake it was, then they're going to inject you with... You know, brown snake antibenin, which is like getting bitten by a brown snake when so really you need it. When you've got a tiger snake bite. Right, or right. Yeah, yeah. But the, the question I wanted to ask was when, when um, you walked in to your mother with the um, red back on your hand and she freaked out, what was your law of attraction and how did that happen? Well, remember our law of attraction is our parents' law of attraction when we're little. So it's actually my mother's law of attraction. I was taking into her, a spider, to help trigger her emotional injury. You follow me? So I'm taking into her. Instead what happened, instead of her feeling her fears and, and emotions about that particular emotional injury, instead what she did was connected me, connected with a lot of fear within her, with me. So what happened is I, I'm not really afraid of the spider. What I'm afraid of is my mother's reaction to the spider. Does that make sense? And that's what was injected into me, if you like. So now when I see the spider, I'm afraid of my mother's reaction. I'm 
trying to nurse my mother's reaction. This happened to me with cats and all sorts of things, and this is why many children get allergies, right? So with cats, for example, my father, whenever he saw a cat, wanted to shoot one. So me having a nice relationship with a cat was already in disagreement or disharmony with my father's approval. Does that make sense? So what am I looking for as a child? I'm looking for, firstly, my mother and father's approval. So what happened with me then? Every time I picked up a cat, I started having a runny nose. Right? So runny nose, runny nose. And eventually I got such bad that I had these puffy eyes and runny... You know what it's like with an allergy like that. And, just, and what I had to do there was work through my emotional connection with my father with cats and what I felt there. Once I did that, I can pick up a cat and the cat sleep on my bed or whatever and it's fine. So a lot of times it's actually our relationship with the parent that causes the injection of the emotion. And, and at what point does that change? Like if you walked in now with a funnel web on your hand and you showed it to your mum, she'd probably still freak out. She would, but now that I've dealt with that causal childhood fear, her freaking out, uh, and not so much the causal childhood fear about spiders, but the causal childhood fear about her reaction. You see, if I get rid of that, now I can show mum as fun with spider, she can freak out and I'll smile and say, oh, that's funny. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's what I do with my mother-in-law and snakes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so can you see how when we become an adult and we've released the connection between the childhood experience and the person, what, it, what happens then is that we are total able, totally able to be in our own emotion and therefore no matter how you react, to what I say won't affect me in that state. And this is where all of you are headed, right? If you keep progressing on the divine love path, you'll get to a point where you will no longer be worried about what anybody else thinks of you, does with you, does to themselves, any of those things. None of those things will bother you. They won't trigger you, right? And you will stay in your own emotions in that state and know that there's nothing to be afraid of in that state. And not just know it here, you'll feel it all inside of you. So you, the feeling of fear won't even cross your emotional state at all. So, so in your case with snakes, you obviously don't have any causal emotion too much about snakes, but you're, it was driven by your parents' fear of snakes to a degree. Right? Well, so my, my mother was terrified of snakes. And when I asked her whether it would be okay to collect them, she said, absolutely not. Yeah. So I, uh, I said, well, I'll just ask Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, that'll be fine. <laughs> and uh, over the course of, uh, of some years of her um, being confronted with snakes, I used to have a death adder in my uh, bedroom in, a, in an aquarium, and yeah. she had to deal with that. And once she was watering one of the brown snakes and it got out, and she actually caught it by the tail and got it back in, which was a, a, a big thing in her life. Yeah, and, yeah. and I managed to get her to um, touch um, pythons and, and, and green tree snakes and things. And so over a period of time, a child, she, she faced that. Yeah, so can you see as a child you were really just helping your mum deal with her fear? Mm. And it began when you were very, very young. And part of your love of those animals, and part of your personality is a love of those kind of animals, which actually was one of the attractions of your mum giving birth to you in the first place. It's about actually helping her deal through those fears and sensations that she felt within herself. So if, if are you saying then, if my mum hadn't have been afraid of snakes, I might end up with a different mum? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Highly likely, Peter. Because well, the, the law of attraction is very, very pinpoint <laughs> accurate. And so our emotional condition and our personality before we're incarnated and our emotional condition of our parents does determine the interaction that occurs. So when I walked into my mum with the redback spider, she had a choice. The choice was to either experience the emotion inside of herself or she could then deny that emotion and reflect that back at me. And because I was a pretty sensitive child in terms of emotions, straight away I interpret that as a disapproval from my mother. That makes sense. So now seeing a spider, up until recently seeing a spider, was always a feeling related to my mother in reflection. Yeah? Mm. That makes sense. Jen, you would like to? <coughs> you keep your hand up so that that's it. Yeah. 
my question is about higher order creatures. Yep. I was bitten by a dog when I was three. Yep. Could you please explain how, as a little mite like that, yep. the dogs used to come to visit across the road, belong to a neighbour of ours. Mm -hmm. um, my mother had said that the dog was always a very passive kind of a creature, mm -hmm. but on this occasion um, it bit really badly and I got off, went off to hospital and all the rest of it. So how does that work? Well, someone in your family had to have been afraid of dogs. It would have been my mother again. And she would have been reflecting that fear. You would have just been, what happened to you was a reflection of that fear. I've been bitten by a dog four times um, in my life and my mother's terrified of, a, of animals. Even my father gets bitten by them as well. And so obviously I had both parents very afraid of those things. If my, my father even got bitten by a cat once. Which is related to why he hates cats so much, you see. And, uh, and then another time he got bitten by a cat and he, he kicked it over the fence. <laughs> but but it, he's been bitten a number of times by cats and dogs. So there's those, both of those fears inside. So the person. animal would have been intuitive enough when it came to visit to pick up the fear that was already there. Always. And then... And your mum might not, not, not have had a personal fear, but a fear of you being bitten by it. You see, there's all these different flavours of fears that we have as well that create law of attraction events. So sometimes we're not afraid of something happening to ourselves, but we're afraid of something happening to our children. Many of you feel that right now, right? If, if you had a choice, if your child died right now, would that be better or worse for you than if you died right now? You see, for many of you, you would feel it's better that you die first. For many of you. Some of you feel it's better that your child dies, but they're all basically based around emotional injuries, right? And often we have different flavours of emotional injuries that cause... So wounds. maybe that might have been a protective issue, a, f a projection from my mother about protection, a fear of wanting to protect me. Fear of you not being protected, perhaps, yeah. But the key is for you to go into it emotionally and you'll discover the reason. Yep. So when you visit those emotions everything comes clear very clearly, very rapidly. Yep. So these two, getting back to these two primary beliefs, this second one I'd like to talk about a little more. Most of us have the problem that we don't really know God yet. Right? So how do you actually love someone you don't feel you know? That's a difficulty, isn't it? And then how do you receive love from someone who you're not even sure exists because you've never had a personal experience of God or you've never saw, seen God or, you know what I mean? Like, so how do you know that you can connect to God? So this is a big issue that we need to allow ourselves to address as a fear as well. So let's look at some of the comments about the second part from a truth perspective. I mean belief in the truth that there is a close relationship between God and the individual which may be established by prayer and the longings of the soul for the inflowing of God's love. So this is a quote from um, the, the Book of Truths there, if you like. So the truth is that these celestial spirits were saying that there is the truth of you being able to have a close relationship with God and that, it, that relationship is established by the longings of your soul. So they're telling you that truth. But when you hear that truth, you go, oh, I don't feel any close relationship with God, you know. I in my life, I've only had what, a few experiences that I thought God was involved in and even then I don't really know whether it was God or might have been a spirit for all I know now that I'm learning about spirits and like I don't really know and so this is why many of us also get into this into the pattern of uh, we, we know that we've felt our spirit guide with us some of us right and so we start talking to them instead of God right? so we start having relationships with spirits instead and many of us who have had a history on the new age path would probably feel that way there's another quote God's love is for the mortal even if he has the passions and appetites which the flesh encumbers him with and when a mortal fights against the temptations which these burdens impose and overcomes them, he, when he enters the spirit world, is stronger and more able to progress than when he puts off the great attempt until he becomes purely spirit. You see, part of this thing is 
I've heard many of you say, ah, oh, I think I'll put off with dealing, I'll put off dealing with my emotions until I pass. Right? It's going to be easier there. Right? And here we have a spirit saying totally the opposite to you, that it's actually easier if you pass knowing how to deal with your emotions, knowing how to deal with your passions and desires, knowing how to deal with your fears. It's going to be easier when you pass. But often we go down the track, no, no, it's pretty hard. Like, you know, gee, last week I cried for whatever, how many hours, four hours or whatever, and that was pretty intense when I did that, we might feel. And oh, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, I just want to have fun. Girls just want to have fun. <laughs> you know, like so, so off we go and we just go and have the fun, uh, avoiding the emotions, right? And, uh, and the problem with that is that we finish up passing without a real clear idea of how to deal with my emotions, with a lot of fear in me, and, and it's not easier there. These spirits are saying from their own experience that it's not. Here's another one. As you are aware, God's love is all around you and may be in you, and if permitted to flow into your soul with faith accompanying it, you'll find yourself growing in it one with the Father and realise that fact. You see... Often we don't even permit God's love to enter us because we're in such a state of fear that we, we don't even want to connect with God. Like, so there's all these issues about I'm alone. These are big, it's a big fear. There's like whole groups of issues, if you like, involved in that. Now, you get into a causal emotion where you're feeling some terror and you will feel very alone in that moment. Right? And so then what we have a tendency of doing is saying, all right, I'm totally alone, I can't experience this, and then we go into this one, I can't cope with this emotion, I'm alone doing this, I can't cope with this emotion. And what we've just told ourselves is two complete untruths. The truth is, right at the moment you're dealing with a causal emotion, sometimes even hundreds of people are around you and from the spirit world trying to assist you to connect with that. And God is certainly with you as well. So you're not alone. And then on top of that, God designed you to experience all of your emotions. That's the way God designed you. So you are designed to cope with everything. That's how you're designed. You don't need anyone else to help you cope with anything because you are designed to cope with it yourself. These two fear-based beliefs cause huge amounts of problems for us in our own processing. Does that make sense? Now, they are the first two beliefs. If you can deal with those two beliefs and release them emotionally, if you can deal with them, what will happen is the rest of your emotions will flow much more rapidly. Right? And each of those have different flavours, if you like, but if you can deal with those two base fears, that's the way to go. So what do we do now, on, pra on a practical way to face our fears. So that's what I'd like to talk about next. What are some practical things you can do? Well, let's first look at environmental, your environment, changing your environment. So I would put this under environment. Things that you can do to change your environment so that you can experience fear. Now, some of these things are going to be emotional that you'll need to do, and some of them will be physical things that you can do. The first thing is drink lots of water. Most people go, what's that related to fear? Trust me, if you drink lots of water, you'll start realising why you use your tea and why you use your coffee and why you use your Coke and why you use your, you know, can you see, like all these other things that we use you'll start seeing why you use them, and they're all related to fear of dealing with deeper emotion. All right? When you drink water, and my suggestion is four to six litres of water a day. So I drink about five a day myself, but if you drink that amount of water, you'll need to have mineral salts in your diet. So that's the other thing to remember, some, just some sea salts, you know, like something like Celtic sea salt or something like that that's got mineral. It's in it. So drink water. What does that do? Every cell in your body is like a machine. It's a machine that takes in mostly water and expels impurities. And it uses the water 
to manufacture everything else. It uses the water and a combination of minerals in your diet and, and vitamins in your diet to manu keep itself going. The cells are like these little, every single cell of which you've got hundreds of billions in your body is like a little manufacturing system. Now, I don't know if you've gone to any manufacturing process here on the earth, like you go to a chocolate factory or you go to a sheet metal factory or whatever, you know, the, at the base metal place, you'll find that they use huge amounts of water to actually manufacture that particular thing. In fact, water is the thing that's used the most in every single manufacturing process almost. Right? And the reason why is because water is, forms the basis of our planet and forms the basis of our body, it forms the basis of everything. If you don't supply your body with enough water, <coughs> your body doesn't have the chance to regenerate from, the, from all of the things that we're throwing at it emotionally. So just drinking water opens you up emotionally. Right? So focus on drinking some water. Eat vegan. These are just suggestions. You don't have to do them. For a start, eating vegan is the most loving thing you can do to the environment. Right? It uses the least amount of resources in your environment. You're actually being the most loved towards your environment when you eat in that manner. Also, you're being very loving to your own body. Your own body will respond to that. Now, what will happen emotionally is you'll go through a lot of emotional withdrawals food-based in particular, emotional withdrawals. And those emotional withdrawals are all related to different emotions that you're using food to suppress. Does that make sense? And what often happens is that we have an emotion come up. How many of you find this happening in a day? Like ladies, chocolate, period time? You see the relationship. Any time. <laughs> But you can see it ups usually at certain times of stress, right? Certain times of things going on emotionally. With uh, guys, it's often different things like Coke or some other type of uh, sugar-based uh, drink. Right? And for many guys, it's alcohol right? for, for similar reasons. We, we search for some substance to give us the coping mechanism to deal with an emotion that we really need to not cope with and just experience. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so give up coping with emotion and start allowing the experience of the emotion. Stop using drink and food as mechanisms to deny your emotion. Now, trust me, even just doing those two things, you're going to feel some fear. Right? And uh, what I did once was I went on this diet, right? Um, where I just had fruit for a whole weekend. This was way, way back before I even knew about the Divine Love Path and remembered it again. And just ba back, b way back, like we were talking in my 20s. By the second day, my whole body was shaking like this. Like, had, you'd call them the DTs, right? Like, <laughs> whole body was just shaking, shaking like this. And eventually, my whole body and all this turmoil was happening in my stomach as well at the same time. Eventually, I just had to eat. That's the way I thought, right? And I just went. As soon as I had one thing to eat, the whole thing stopped. What was going on there? Me just eating fruit for two days and drinking water triggered huge emotions that I wasn't allowing myself to experience, right? And this is what will happen to many if you do that. So eat vegan. These are practical things to do in your environment. Number three, have a place that you can experience anger in. All right? So create a place somewhere where you can experience anger. So in our place, because we live in a bigger, a, a bit bigger property than just a yard like in the town, we've got just we just hang on the back back wall of the house, a boxing bag, got a couple of uh, baseball bats. We've got a, uh, a metal baseball bat for hitting some metal a bit further out. And uh, whenever myself or Mary feels angry, we're out there connecting with that anger and then allowing the experience of that anger and then trying to drop into the fear of it. What, what am I afraid of each time? Right? So allow yourself to do that. With fear, you may have to have a quiet sort of a location 
that you can actually use your imagination to actually go into a certain fear and then allow the bodily experience of it. And, uh, and that might be your bedroom or sometimes it's another room in your house or something like that. Try and arrange something in your environment. So arrange, arrange your home so that you can experience anger and fear. Right? Without judgment. So if everyone in your family, every time you get angry, gets upset with you, it's time to consider leaving your family for a while and going somewhere where nobody gets upset with you doing it. Does that make sense? Now, I don't mean they get upset with you projecting it at them because if you're projecting it at them, you're already out of harmony with love, right? I'm talking about owning it within yourself and experiencing it for yourself. Let yourself experience those emotions. Does that make sense? Create a space around you where you can experience those emotions. What's the next thing we can do? Well, yeah, the, you know, it's no good doing all of these things um, and then not giving yourself any time to process any of it, is it? Right? So you're going to have to somehow change your life if it's a very busy life and by the way, it's probably busy because you're avoiding <laughs> your fears. But you have to cha somehow change, may take an active steps to change your life so that you can start getting into the emotions of it. Because if you don't get into the emotions of it, you're never going to actually release it. So we can, we can do all of these things to trigger ourselves but then give ourselves no time to process and we're just going to get into a terrible mess. We need to give ourselves enough love to actually experience it, to experience the thing. So, so emotionally, love yourself. So act in a loving way hum, to yourself. Give yourself the time that you have to deal with these emotions. All right. Now what's happening at the moment is quite a lot of uh, spirits are here now with us. A lot of you are starting to feel really tired and everything and, and feeling quite disconnected. You're, a lot of you, because what's happening is we're talking about a subject, fear, which causes the depression usually of people. And so what we'd like to do is get you to stand up for a moment. Right. Now you might want to move into a clear space somewhere around you. So you might want to get out behind a chair and move into a clear space. And what we want to do is put your arms right up in the air and breathe right in. And then as you breathe out, bend over. Right. That's it. And you go up again. And as you're going up, breathe in. And then out. And this time do it faster. Right? You can bend your legs a little as you go down. And then in again. Keep going. I want to get that body flowing a bit. Just keep going. Do, do it a few more times. Some of you will start feeling a bit tingly in your face and everything. Don't worry too much about that. Just keep doing this a few more times. If you feel a bit faint, then you might want to sit down or, or go onto the floor. But keep doing it until you feel a little faint. All right? Until you feel a little faint. Yeah? Until you feel a bit wonky. If you feel a bit wonky, lay down on the floor and just let yourself breathe diaphragmatically. How are we feeling? Doesn't take long to feel a bit faint, does it? All right. So if you're feeling a bit faint, just uh, grab a chair somewhere and and might want to sit that down. How are you feeling now? You're feeling a little more connected with yourself. 
Now, many of you are now starting to have quite a bit of tension in this tummy area here. Through here, can you feel that? You try breathing diaphragmatically and you'll find that there's resistance to breathing into your tummy for many of you. That's your fear. Your fear prevents you breathing into that place. All right, so if you sit down now or maybe even lie down if you wish and just try to concentrate on just breathing into that area of your body, into that tummy area of your body. We want to stay connected with the emotions. So, so we don't want to get into a depressed state with our emotions, facing our emotions. What we want to do instead is stay in the area where we feel connected with our emotion. So if that means feeling connected with fear, feel the fear. Now, you'll feel it as like a tummy turmoil in here. So many of you are already feeling that. So just allow yourself to feel that. Allow yourself to feel it. So what I'm showing you now is some just little practical tools that you can use to stay in contact with your body and stay in contact with your fear. All right, so you might like to close your eyes and just breathe into this place, into this, into the diaphragm. I'll just say a few things while you're doing that. There are many spirit beings around you at any one time. When you get into a place where you start connecting with your fear, many of these spirits get at attracted to you. So the more I talk about fear, the more spirits are going to be attracted to us who are also in a state of fear. Does that make sense? So keep breathing. Now, those spirits will do one of two things for you. One thing they'll try to do with you is to make you feel tired and exhausted. All right? And so the key for you, if that's the case, is to recognize, all right, I'm feeling tired and exhausted. I wasn't feeling tired and exhausted before AJ, damn AJ, started talking about this fear crap. And all of a sudden now, I'm in this state where I don't really want to be here, I want to go. Understand, that's because of some feelings inside of me about the subject of fear. Right? So I need to allow myself to feel what I feel about that. Now some of us have this intellectual belief that I haven't got any fear anymore. And I can tell you, with you categorically that there is nobody in this room that's in that state of not having any fear in them anymore. So the key is to allow yourselves to connect with what's going on inside of yourself. It's okay to be afraid. I'm allowed to be afraid. When you were little, you were often taught you weren't allowed. I'm saying to you, you're allowed to be afraid. All right? And I'm not going to tell you you've got nothing to fear because there's plenty of things from your childhood that you know you are afraid of. All right? So allow yourself to be afraid. You're allowed to feel the fear. Okay. How are you going now? Now, all the spirits that are with us, I just want to talk to them for a moment too. You're allowed to feel your fear too, rather than affecting the people here in the room with your fear. So rather than making them more afraid or tuning out of their fear, what you need to do is tune in to your fear. You need to feel your fear too. And you need to connect to that fear and release it emotionally. Remember, that's what it's all about. Now, just as a practical thing for you, you know that breathing, that's a very, very quick way for you to get reconnected with your body. So if you find in the course of a day that you're not connected with your body, then do some of that breathing and you'll very rapidly get reconnected with your body generally. And you'll feel the reason why you're avoiding your body. And so the key is to feel the sensations in your body. Fear is in this area here mostly, right across your midriff, your third chakra area, if you think of it that way. So fear is a lot across there. So when you feel tight in that region of your body, you're often in a state where there's fear there. 
when you breathe like we just breathed, many of you will notice when you breathed in and went up, you felt this pain across there, across that midsection area where it felt really tight and uncomfortable. And uh, some of you would have felt a pain there. The key, that's telling you that you're in a state of fear in that, that's, that's not being released. So let yourself feel that. Okay. So how do you feel about that breathing? How are you doing with the breathing? All right. Now, what was happening just earlier was that many of you were connecting with spirits who had two, one of two different goals. One of the goals was to shut you down emotionally. They are shut down emotionally and they want you to shut down emotionally. Some of them are your friends who have passed. Some of them are your old family members that have passed and so forth. And they don't believe a word I'm saying and they, they're try saying to you, you shouldn't believe a word he's saying either. And they want you to remain like they are in themselves, in the spirit world still remaining in a state of shutdown. So that's one group. And the second group is a state who are in this terror-based place and want you to feel terrified constantly. Right? And some of them are angry and so they want to project that anger at you so you're terrified and so forth. So the key for you to remember that these are all just law of attraction events. Now, often what we're doing emotionally is we're not recognizing what's going on around us and that's often because we're not connected inside of ourselves what's going on inside of myself. When I'm shutting down an emotion inside of myself, that's when my law of attraction is going to be the most powerful about that emotion. So it's the opposite to what people tell you. What people tell you is if, if you re-experience an emotion of your childhood, that all you're doing is damaging yourself over and over again. And what I'm saying is, no, that's not the case. If you allow yourself to actually experience the causal emotion, it will be released from you completely, but you need to experience the causal emotion to do that. Dennis, you would like to ask a question? Thank you. Um, yawning, is that another way of them suppressing you? Yeah. Because I find myself doing that a lot. Yep. Kim and I will be reacting and I'll just keep yawning. Yep. Especially when, when she gets saying, you, you don't want to hear me. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. But, but again, after maybe an hour, hour and a half, I'm just exhausted. Yep. And I haven't said a word. Exactly. Because there's obviously emotions coming out of you to Kim and emotions coming from her. And if you, if you try to reconnect with yourself in that state, you'll understand why you're yawning. And yes, yawning is also a mechanism that our spirit friends... I don't know if you've noticed that sometimes people have asked me a question. I've answered the question that's given in the audience... And then within five minutes, that person who I answered the question to is asleep. I don't know if you've noticed that happening, but I've noticed that happening from up here <laughs> quite a lot. What happens there a lot of times is the person didn't want to hear that answer and then straight away goes into avoidance of emotionally processing that answer. And then any spirits who are around them or who also did not want to hear that answer just assist them in that process. And you can go to sleep within five minutes or two minutes from that place. So one moment they're being totally absorbed by something, another moment asleep. And you'll notice in many of our groups, the hardest groups I've ever given uh, to an audience have all been the ones around anger and fear. I don't know if you've noticed that. But the last time I talked about fear, a lot of the audience felt very similar to how you're feeling at the moment. And the, the, we're very, the, the most difficult presentation I've ever done to a group of people was a presentation in Brisbane where I talked about anger. Almost the entire afternoon was one of suppression by large groups of spirits and a lot of people not wanting to hear about their anger. So they are two very common suppression emotions that we need to allow ourselves to work our way through. Allow yourself to feel your body. So this is the next thing on a daily basis. Allow yourself to feel your body's pains. Uh -huh. your body often will have pains every single day. And when I say pains, I'm not just talking about the physical pains either that you feel, but also the internal organ pains that you have sometimes and also the pains you have about your body when you look in the mirror. Uh -huh. Allow yourself to feel every one of those things. So when you look in the mirror and you're looking a bit old and drawn today, you know, you acknowledge that and allow yourself to feel the emotion inside of you 
that it responds to seeing yourself in the mirror like that. Ah, oh, I look terrible. You know, and allow yourself to connect with that emotionally. That's what I'm suggesting to you. And allow yourself to connect emotionally to the physical pains you feel. Every pain is a result of a fear of dealing with an underlying emotion. Does that make sense? Every pain is a result of a fear of dealing with an underlying emotion. Right? So any pain in your body is a result of a fear of dealing with an underlying emotion. So if I've got a headache, that's the result of a fear of dealing with grief. Right? And my mind struggles by creating a lot of activity and all of a sudden I'll get a headache because I don't want to deal with the grief. Every pain in your body is like that, every single pain. Now, at any one time, many of you will feel lots of different pains if you're connected. The key is to not freak out about that and to get upset about that. The key is just to acknowledge them. All right, I've got a pain in my left leg. All right, what's that about? Left side, you know, I could go intellectually into it, but the key is to go emotionally into it. And the way I do that myself is just feel the pain in my left leg. Just breathe and feel it and just say, I am in denial of an underlying emotion. And just keep breathing and keep breathing into that pain. The other day, myself and Mary were in the kitchen and all of a sudden, my arm, my left arm was just, my shoulder was so painful that all that happened is I just, I just knelt on the floor in the kitchen and just cried. There was so much pain in my arm. Right? And then as soon as I did that, I knew what the denial was about. Right? As soon as I allowed myself to connect to that, to connect to the pain. Up until then, I'd been saying to Mary, gee, this pain in my arm, you know. I've had a, the pain in my arm for a week or two before then, solid, but not to that intensity. And I never allowed myself to go into it, you see. But as soon as I allowed myself to go into it, immediately I knew what it was about. Whereas... If I hadn't allowed myself to go into it, I would have been still trying to guess what it was all about. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're getting lots of lovely pictures here at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's some more? Uh, sorry, question. Oh, I, I just wanted to say that I've been fighting sleep all the way through your talk up until the breathing, and I now feel wide awake. Okay. Thank yep. you. No worries. <laughs> I don't know if you should thank me. It might have been my voice putting you to sleep. No. <laughs> Better just microphone. If if headaches are the uh, the fear of dealing with grief, then is, is a migraine a more acute? Um, yeah, very intense grief underneath the migraine. Because I was talking to a lady last night who said she suffers from a migraine every single day. Yeah, and that'd I be told terrible. her that to look in look in a childhood. Yep. for what could be causing that. Yeah, deep grief in her childhood. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and um, the same, obviously the different areas of your body mean different things and you can go and get a book like The Human Body is the Barometer of the Soul and those kind of books and see the relationship. But in the end, the, sometimes the fastest way is actually just to breathe into the feeling. When you breathe into the feeling, all of a sudden, you know, you start allowing the feelings to flow and you'll find out pretty rapidly, usually after that, what the emotion is. My daughter this week, funnily enough, has just randomly got a headache or a bellyache, yep. um, headaches in particular. Yep. Is that a denial of grief on my part? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So remember, every time we're a parent and we're dealing with a child's emotion, it's to do with our denial. And um, recently I was just talking to a, a mother with, uh, we were talking to a mother with a nine-year-old child who's in terrible pain on lots of different levels. And, and she goes to her mother and tells her what her mother should be doing to, for her to get rid of that pain, right? So, um, yeah, and, and often the mother doesn't do that, so she then gets angry with her mother for not doing it. But um, often, almost all the time, a child experiencing a pain is the result, definite result, of one or both parents not dealing with a certain pain. Yeah. And usually it's a law of attraction, so, so if the child comes to you about the pain, and doesn't go to her dad about the pain, then it's your. Yeah, but if the child goes to dad about the pain and not you, then it's something to do with dads, usually. You'll see the law of attraction working quite well. Yep. Well, what we'll do now, I think it's 3 o'clock, is that right? 
So let's say we have a break. We uh, have, so, ha have some food and whatever. And then uh, I'll come back and we'll talk about a lot more of the practical things that you can do to experience your fears.